everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 348. Yeah. I wasn't ready. <laughs> I don't think I was either, but hey, we're live. Uh, welcome to the show. We're really excited about tonight's episode because we get to bring on a friend. Um, mutual connection, Dylan Bowman. So let's start there. Pretty exciting. Uh, but this is uh, Red Bull athlete manager Aaron Lutze is going to be joining us on the show. We're going to talk a little bit about his career path, uh, what it means to be a Red Bull athlete manager, seeing as he manages our dear friend Dylan Bowman, who we've had on the show a number of times. Who's also in the chat room. Is Dylan in the chat? Oh, <laughs> pillars for life, bro. Uh but Aaron is also an ultra runner and caught the bug. I don't know if it's before Dylan or because of Dylan or after Dylan. I'm sure we'll find out. AD, BD, DD, who knows? But uh, we're going to dig into a little bit of his ultra running history and goals and, and stuff like that, as well as some of his past as a mountain bike trials rider. This is a sport that I'm completely unfamiliar with. I've only seen videos that Aaron has posted and stuff. He has a YouTube channel and we'll talk about that. But it's crazy what these individuals can do on a bike with no seat. Yeah, we'll talk about that tonight's show. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 348. The show begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! What is up, everyone? <laughs> Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 348. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Mondays to spend a little bit of it with us. So excited about tonight's show. And it wouldn't be a Ginger Runner Live without the ominous jingles of our dog's collar. <laughs> he's, I don't know what he's doing, but I can hear him and it sounds bad. <laughs> Anytime we sit down now to do, we do daily live streams now uh, with the GR crew and stuff. Every time we sit down in this space to do our daily shows, Gus decides it's the time he's like, I'm awake and I'm going to do everything I wanted to do all day. <laughs> so it's happening right now. If Kim has to step up and leave, it's because <laughs> Gus is eating Cocoa Krispies or something. Uh, we're so excited about tonight's show. As I kind of mentioned in the pre-show there, our guest is a friend of ours, just a wonderful human, a really kind guy who is an ultra runner. Uh, I want to say former, but I don't know if it's former, but mountain bike trials, bike rider. This is a, a new sport that I'm learning purely based off of his videos. He has a YouTube channel and he kind of explains a lot about the bike, the sport, what it means. Uh, we'll dig in a little bit to that because he's been doing that for a number of years and recently set a new record. And I forget if it's a personal record or it's a, we're just going to call it a world record. Maybe it is a world record. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I don't want to say that. And Aaron probably. Aaron, can you nod or, or shake your head? It, it is. Oh, it is not. Okay. Yeah. He, you can't hear him yet, but he just told me, uh, no, not a, not a world record, but maybe a 40s plus. <laughs> we'll talk about it when we when we bring him on. But I'm very excited. Aaron Lutze is going to be joining us on the show tonight. Uh, Red Bull athlete, marketing manager, working with athletes such as Dylan Bowman, uh, amongst many others. And uh, kind of want to know what it what it takes to, to do that, the career path to get there and stuff. It's going to be a fun show. I'm actually yeah. really excited about this one. Before we do uh, introduce our guest, of course, we're, I'm not the only one. Our guest isn't the only one. We've got Kim. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm <laughs> doing well. What's up, everyone? Kim Tshima Newberry here. Uh, welcome. If you're new, we do have some people popping in saying the first time I've been able to join live in a long time. So welcome. We will be bringing welcome. Aaron on in just a second. So if you do have questions for Aaron, please ask him in the chat room. Yeah. And if we have uh, GR crew members, if you want to ask questions and make sure that those get asked today, you can jump into the Discord and post them on the uh, Ginger Runner Live uh, channel. And we'll make sure that those questions absolutely get asked during the main show. Priority. We love it. Uh, and of course, before we introduce our guests, we have some individuals that we like to thank at the top of the show. That's our GR crew. As I just mentioned, uh, we are completely supported on Patreon, patreon.com slash the ginger runner. It is because of our GR crew and the members over on Patreon that we're able to do this full time. Uh, they are the ones that keep the lights on the mics hot and uh, allow us to do daily live streams, mm -hmm. weekly ginger runner live reviews, films, all sorts of good stuff. Uh, so thank you, GR Group. Two individuals in particular at that top tier. Brian Sands, longtime supporter, incredibly inspiring individual who ran his first marathon at 55, uh, trained for his first ultra, ran that. Currently training for a 200-plus mile endurance event. The guy is incredibly inspiring. Big shout-out to Brian. And Rick Bjarnison, uh, who's a Canadian ultra runner and supporter here. He works at a company called CheekyMonkeyMedia.ca. They are a web design slash web maintenance company. They did the GingerRunner.com website. Really talented ultra runner, and we're excited to have him on board as well. So thank you to our entire crew, those two individuals in particular. 
without further ado. Oh, look, I've got the I've got the sun rays coming across my face. I've got oh, I thought it was makeup. It is. It moves. <laughs> I'm a uh, I'm I'm a moving NFT. Buy it now. Uh, our guest is patiently waiting for us to introduce him. He's just uh, he's such a rad dude. I can't wait to get the conversation started. Without further ado, coming to us all the way from about two hours south, two and a half hours south. Aaron Lutzi. <laughs> What's up, dude? Pumped to be here. Pumped to get a chance to chat with you guys for a bit. This is awesome. Dude, I like. We've obviously been friends now for a number of years. We've worked on some really cool projects together. We have the most incredible mutual friend, Dylan Bowman, of course. Uh, but it's been this really fun friendship that like, kind of came out of work, I guess. And one thing I really admire about you is that you, you're really good at your job because you are such a personable person. Like You deal with some of the best athletes in the world. But you would never know that like, there's no ego, right? It's just, hey, man, I, I love working with these incredible athletes and, and people from around the world while simultaneously doing really cool projects. So this is going to be a cool conversation because I want to start digging into like what it takes to do what you do, what's sort of involved in the nuance of it, but also the opportunities and, and sort of your connection with sport because you have a unique perspective working with so many different athletes and different sports and stuff. So kind of where I want to start is maybe let's introduce you and your connection to the outdoors. You know, you live in the Northwest and and what got you into, I, I don't want to call them extreme sports, but maybe more niche sports. What's sort of your connection? Yeah, well, actually I started, I grew up in Wisconsin, which is not uh, known for a lot of niche sports or really a lot of sports at all. Uh, and I didn't move out to the Northwest until much, much later. Uh, until about 2005. So I started off as a mountain bike trials rider because when I was in high school, I wasn't big enough to play any other sports. And uh, I was actually five foot two through most of high school. And so sports that required athletic ability were not for me. And trials riding specifically, this is like rock climbing on mountain bikes. Yeah. You have to be good at technique. You have to have good brake control, good pedal control, and all these things I didn't necessarily need muscle or strength or size for. And so that was kind of my entrance into the sport in general. And I got good at that and, and found my way through the, the national ranks and did demos and traveled the world and did all this stuff. And that was actually kind of how I got in the mix with Red Bull and how I got in the mix with filmmaking and all these different things because I was finding ways to try to keep the dream alive a little bit. Mm. And so I was like, okay, uh, I can take a camera and film my friends now who are also all pro riders and we'll create content and we'll make a... A, v a VHS. Um, I don't know if you've heard of those before. <laughs> and uh, and that so puts you just... into a very specific decade. So yeah. I appreciate that. And we that. know what that is. So yeah. now you're exposing our age as well. <laughs> I mean, I read about it on the internet when I was a kid. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I, I started working with athletes, you know, in that way. And, and, you know, I stuck with it as technology advanced. We went from VHS all the way into live streaming. We were making branded content um, in the mountain bike industry specifically and working with Red Bull a lot. And I got to know a lot of people there. And eventually there became a moment where they said, hey, do you want to just like maybe work with us and, and do stuff with us? And and that's kind of how I how I got my way, you know, my foot in the door and, and started uh, working with Red Bull full time. But I've really had a chance to be an athlete first, a content creator, and then now, you know, kind of on the other side of it with the Red Bull thing, working with athletes and content creators and, and kind of making it all come together and understanding as many different perspectives as I possibly can. How did, I mean, I guess, how does that part of it work? Because it's such a cool, it sounds like you have the best job in the world. Because you get to, you get to do the cool stuff. You get to work with the cool people, and you get to make the cool things. Like you get to kind of do a little bit of all of it. Has it been a blast the entire time? Like in my mind, I'm going, man, this is it—the best job ever. Best job <laughs> ever. Uh, what's it been like for you, and and going through that evolution over the last few decades? I mean, I yeah, for sure, the highs are super high, but you still have to do a lot of the work along the way. You know, I still have to sit in budget meetings. I still have to put together Excel documents. I still have to do all the things. You know, I think a lot of the projects that I've done over the years have been really difficult, but you know that they're possible. You know that especially Red Bull has been able to pull off things of that level before. And so uh, you just want to, you know, keep the streak going basically. Yeah. But, but uh, certainly, you know, the, the way I kind of think about what I do is 
you know, most athletes have a coach, uh, maybe a manager, you know, like kind of a team around them that's putting stuff together. And I like to think of myself as that remaining 1% where I'm kind of sit, sitting back from necessarily their sport. I'm not just in ultra running or just in mountain biking. I'm working with a gamer over here. I'm working with a basketball player. I'm working with a roller derby athlete. And what can I take from each one of those things and then bring it back to, you know, Dylan for ultra running or, you know, Kate Courtney for mountain biking. What can I offer them as that extra 1% that maybe they wouldn't have seen or thought about just because they're so locked into their sport. How can I help Dylan think about ultra running through the lens of gaming or mountain biking or basketball or whatever? There's so much crossover that I have the ability to see. And if I can bring that to him or to any athlete that I work with, um, that's really exciting. You know, what can I take from ultra running and, and offer up to basketball? Like those are cool conversations to, to have. I mean, what a unique perspective because it, uh, especially with such niche sports that you're able to take what you can learn from one and communicate with someone from another sport and sort of find that bond, find that connection. It, it's a really interesting, unique perspective that I don't think a lot of athletes have access to. Do you find, is it challenging to do that? Like, or do you enjoy doing that? Is it, is that part of the job that you really enjoy doing, trying to find those connections? Or is it the, like, how can I take a gamer and sort of find the connection to an ultra runner, you know, those types of things? I mean, I guess like I, I, the way I think about meeting people or working with people is that I have an opportunity to learn from every single person I'm with. And so if I have a chance to meet someone from this sport or from this background or, you know, doesn't even have to be somebody in sports, it's just an opportunity to learn. So what can I, what is that one thing I can glean from them, you know, and, and how can I apply that over here and, and plug it in? So, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, that is the fun part. And, and I'm always reading. I'm like, super bookworm um and just try to listen to as much as i can and learn as much as i can and then yeah kind of chip it chip away at it to figure out what's what's valuable there and what can i then share with someone um rebecca rush who was one of my athletes for a long time is a an endurance mountain biker and i gave her the book the obstacle is the way right before she went and rode the ho chi minh trail oh wow um, and so you know stuff like that where it's like oh i i found this book through you know whatever I know you really well. I know you're looking for this element just to like, I know you're kind of struggling a little bit with what you're about to do. And I think this book is the thing that's going to help you. And so it's like, like I said, I'm like the 1% of just like, this is maybe the thing you were missing that might complete the picture for you. You've done all the training. You've got all the content stuff ready to go. Everything is in place. Maybe you just need a little tweak and here's this is the right book or this is the right podcast or this is a song that maybe whatever or this is a, a mindset to think about this that's what i love most about what i get to do and and what my the opportunity i have and how it affords to me do you have the benefit uh and this might be a little little too inside baseball but just in regards to having at your disposal the ability to do pretty amazing things with a with a company like red bull behind you are you able to think well outside the box. Uh, so for example, uh, let's, well, let's talk about Dylan Bowman one because he's probably in the chat. And I think uh, <laughs> he loves hearing his name. I think he has to drink every time we say his name. So that's great. Uh, but let's use Dylan as an example, just an ultra runner. Um, Dylan is just an ultra runner, by the way. <laughs> when you think of an idea of like, let's get him in touch with maybe this other person in another country, or what can we do if we bring these types of people together? Or let's do you have the ability to sort of pitch these big ideas to Red Bull and for them to go, yeah, this is great. If this benefits this person and this person or like, is it, is, is it that type of relationship where you can really have, I guess, all expense, you know, you have everything at your disposal. Is that sort of the perk of benefit? I don't necessarily know if that's just a Red Bull thing. Um, you know, prior to coming to Red Bull, we did the same thing. In fact, uh, I was working with a, a mountain biker from Seattle at the time I was filming and we decided we were going to go around the world and we were going to ride a different mountain bike on a different continent with the best rider there. And this was not a Red Bull thing. It was just, you know, manifesting a dream of, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we went to Africa and donated bikes with Hans Ray? And then wouldn't it be cool if we went to Australia and rode bikes with, you know, and so we put this thing together and then you just work backwards of like, well, what would need to be true for this to happen? Mm -hmm. And how could I put this together? And what, what things would need to fall into place? And how much would it really take to get this done? 
and you start breaking it down and you go upstream a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more and you're like, well, okay, first step, I just need to get this in place. And second step of this, like, I think the lesson I learned pre Red Bull was that the budget doesn't necessarily define the success. You know, if, if you can get the right things moving in the right direction, you can always sort of find a way to make it happen. Certainly having the global network that I have access to now, it doesn't hurt, but I don't necessarily think that you could just come in and automatically just start spending money left and right. Yeah, and yeah, no doubt. Uh, and yeah, just a quick update. Kim had to, uh, she's taking care of the dog. She'll be right back. She literally can hear the conversation because she still has her earbud in. Um, a question from the chat. This is from Cody. With Red Bull being so diverse in its sports or avenues that they support, do you find your runners have a benefit to pick brains of other athletes for training and nutrition unlike other brands just because of the diversity of the sports? Oh, for sure. And Dylan could probably answer that question even better than me. But yeah, they're they're connected to all the other athletes. And, you know, we frequently try to get everybody together to hang out, whether it's, you know, uh, here in Portland, like, hey, we've got Blazers tickets. You want to go with uh, Lauren Much, the, you know, the local roller derby athlete who is five time world champion. Like, I would love to be on a fly of the wall for some of those conversations that that they're having. Um, we always try to get everybody together. And it's a pretty tight knit crew. At least my roster is. Um, we end up in the same place at the same time with relative frequency prior to everything that just went down this past year. Yeah. But, uh, you know, yeah, for sure there's a, you know, I, I guess I would call it like cross pollination, right? Like you have all these people that have completely different backgrounds and what are the things that they talk about and share? Like for sure, that's number one on the list I've got to imagine. I certainly want to start digging in into your history as a mountain bike trials writer because I kind of want to sort of build the base with that sport and then find your journey to ultra running. Because I, I think a really interesting thing that at least you and I have talked about is your connection with your athletes kind of involves you partaking in a sport that they specialize in and sort of learning as much as you can about it. So let's start with the mountain bike trials thing first. I'm unfamiliar with this very niche sport. I mean, of course, I'm a mountain bike fan. I love mountain biking. I grew up mountain biking. Is it like that or is it a specific niche of that? And do you see, was it really popular at a certain time and is it still popular? What's going on with it? Well, I think trials writing is, is kind of interesting with, with that perspective. So, uh, I guess I'll back up. So yeah, it's super niche. Um, there are specialized bikes that you can have that don't have seats that you can ride. There are bikes that yeah. have seats that do the same thing that you can also ride. But really, a lot of the techniques also apply to mountain biking. And that's really, you know, what I've been trying to do with my YouTube channel is I could borrow your bike and ride it up and over a picnic table or jump off the edge or jump off, you know, whatever with it. It's not that you have to have a special bike. It's just to do the highest level of riding. It certainly helps. And so what I wanted to do with the YouTube was say like, hey, I've I've honed these skills over the last 20 years, but you could take a few elements of what I'm doing and apply it to your riding so that when you're on the trail next time and a big rock comes in front of you, you can just hop up and over it. Uh, or here's how I think about riding in terms of my progression to see like, am I actually making progress with, uh, with this, you know, mountain bike, uh, here's how I think about it and here's how it can apply to you. So I think really the, the highest level of riding, yeah, there's a really limited amount of people that can do it at that level, right. but the basics of it are available to everyone. And that's really what I'm trying to, sh to get out to everyone is that anybody can do this. And it's, it's really fun. And, you know, I, I like to think of it as like, it's almost like the mountain biking cheat code, right? Like some people can hop a couple inches off the ground, but if you apply some of the principles I'm sharing, you can go a couple feet off the ground. It's really cool to know you. And then like, I never knew you as a trials bike rider. I never knew you, uh, you know, I knew you had a background in mountain bikes and, and trials riding and stuff, but what I hadn't seen was what you could do on a bike. And now with your YouTube channel, Litsy Time, which I encourage everyone to go check out, I think it's it's super fun. It's very approachable looks at trials riding. Uh, you did a video where you went to a new park in Portland that sort of has various levels of uh, like a pump track and uh, a trials rider and like a couple different lines and stuff. And it was like, this is really cool. I can see myself doing what Aaron's doing, but then you whip out the tricks and it's like, oh, oh no, shit. Okay, yeah, no, that's <laughs> beyond my scope of expertise. So having that background as a trials rider and having that sort of athletic ability, getting into uh, working with a company like Red Bull who has that vast variety of sports and athletes that, that are represented there. Tell us a little bit about, is this your 
policy working with your athletes of sort of taking on their sports and taking on their unique passions and trying it for yourself? What's sort of your take on that? Because I, I think it's such a really cool doorway into learning why you did ultra running or started ultra running. You know, it's not it's not a company policy. Uh, most people who are in the athlete marketing department are some sort of, you know, they sh they're shredding something, whether it's snowboard, uh, mountain bike, uh, surfing, you know, whatever. Somebody has, you have some sort of background if you got to this point within Red Bull. And for me, I just saw it again, kind of going back to that same thing, like every person I meet is an opportunity to learn. What an amazing opportunity that, you know, the 10 to 12 people that I'm working with the closest also happen to be the best at the world at these sports. I can be like Neo in the matrix, just like, I know how to ultra run now, you know? Uh, and so I kind of looked at it as this opportunity to pick up a bunch of new talents and, and skill sets. Uh, yeah, I was a skier at the time, so I learned how to snowboard and I could, yeah. you know, hit up John Jackson and say like, how, how does this work? What gear should I have? <laughs> what kind of boots should I be running? How should I be thinking? How should I, how should I get into this? Um, speaking to Rebecca Rush, how do you how do you do this nutrition thing? I don't understand. Do I eat you know before, during, after? And so I had access to the best people in the world to tell me stuff. It would have been such a missed opportunity to not do it. And then I had relatively early on in the process when I first got the job because I'd been at Red Bull for about five years before I got the athlete marketing job. Okay, I was at an event called the Wings for Life World Run. And we had brought all of our athletes together for this event and, uh, the event, which I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about, but, um, Absolutely, yeah. basically everybody starts at the same time all around the world. And so we had all of our athletes on the starting line and we started running and then the finish line comes and catches you. So you're basically trying to outrun this finish line. And I was running with my athletes and then I was running past my athletes. And to that point, I'd only been working with some of those athletes for four to six months and our communication hadn't been, um, super consistent like they they were athletes and they weren't like on it when it came to email responses and stuff and i ended up beating all but one of my athletes in the race that year and i think the perspective from them was oh okay this isn't just like a keyboard jockey this guy can actually like get it done yeah and so the level of respect that i got from them right out of the gate really gave me the the energy to really dive into their sports and and get to know everything about what they did to learn as much as I could, to develop my skill set as much as I could within those sports. And then it just kind of grew from there. And then I met Dylan Bowman. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, up until this point, every athlete I signed was, was uh, you know, I would learn their sport and do their sport. And, you know, it was a great learning experience. And the, the process of signing an athlete at Red Bull is typically a pretty long window. It's, you know, from the first meeting until when you get your Red Bull hat or helmet is like, you know, six to eight, sometimes 12 months. And I would always wow. joke with Dylan, like, Hey man, I, I just don't want to be an ultra runner. That's why we're waiting so long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, through, through that process of getting to know Dylan, uh, and doing a lot of research about ultra running, I came across the wonderland video that you did with Gary. And that was something that kind of caught my attention of like, I think I actually can do this. Like it, the way that Gary was being so articulate about how he was fueling, how he was thinking about running, what he was doing, and just the way that you put it together, I was like, okay, okay, I think I can actually do this. And so um, when I signed Dylan, and then I was like, all right, man, like you're in. Now I got to do an ultra. And uh, he really helped me out a lot with with picking out the right first event, building my training plan for me, getting me in the right gear, like telling me what essentially what to do. <laughs> Uh, and I'd been running for a while before then. I, I was actually really into, I lived in San Francisco prior to Portland and I was in the hash house Harriers there. So I've been a hasher for a year or two at that point. So it wasn't like a non runner, but, uh, that was really like a big step in the right direction for me when I brought, when he and I started working together. And then, you know, the other thing is like all these sports I was doing, working with these athletes, it was building my credibility within the athlete roster at Red Bull and, right. and with everybody I worked with. And once I became an ultra runner, I didn't have to do the next sport. I didn't have to learn anything more because being an ultra runner was like the highest level of credibility you could have. Like that guy's gnarly. Don't, he's definitely, <laughs> he's good, you know? And so like, I could just really just not worry about like, oh, I got to learn how to backcountry snowboard now. I could just be an ultra runner. And, and that's what I did for the following 
you know, a couple of years and into now, but I mean, that really kind of was when I turned the corner on, on sport in general, man, that, that actually brings up a really interesting question in regard, cause you deal with some, again, some of the best athletes in the world in their disciplines, for sure. Do the disciplines look at ultra running as sort of, I mean, like you see skiers and snowboarders drop in to some crazy, uh, Lars and, you know, heli skiing and all this, like just extreme stuff. But do they look at ultra running as sort of that, Oh shit, I'd never do that. Like I'd never touch that. Yeah, absolutely. There's, so cool. Yeah. Respect from every sport across the line. Like they just can't even comprehend, you know, like, oh, I, I ran a 50 mile this weekend in San Francisco. It was like pretty gnarly. They're like, dude, that, whatever. <laughs> They're like, you so, take the hat. I don't need yeah. it. <laughs> no, for sure. I mean, honestly, it's it's like the highest level of respect, you know, from all the sports, you know, from you know, at, at one point I had like, I think 22 different athletes I was working with and every single one of them was just like, dude, that's, I never would even consider that. So that's pretty amazing. Wait till they try it and just find out it's just hiking and snacking. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, no. Yeah, totally. Uh, most extreme sport out there. Yes, please don't try it at home. Uh, there isn't a lot of eating and, and walking and sleeping. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I am curious, did, have you caught the bug? Like is ultra running now a part of your training? Are you training for anything? Like is this an ongoing passion or is it one and done? Like I did I did my thing, I, I met Dylan's challenge and that's it. Well, I'm trying to think. So I've I've run I've run way too cool three times. I did Tiger Claw. I will definitely do it again when it comes back. Um I ran the um, North Face 50. I did the Oregon Coast 30K uh, twice. And then I, I think I have 100K that I had. I had 100K lined up last year. So the, the plan was to do 50K, 50 mile, 100K, 100 mile, like year over year, you know? And so last year was supposed to be my 100K year. So I don't know. I'll have to maybe find one this year to, to jump in at the end of the year or something like that. But that was kind of the plan. Um, I also ran 40 miles for my 40th birthday last year. So, and Dylan came out for a handful of laps there too. So definitely like it was a never a times. one and done thing. And, and, uh, I think for me, especially it's, it's almost like a, a mentality of once you've done it one time, like you're then an ultra runner and like, what's the next challenge? What's the next opportunity? I was actually thinking about this earlier today of like how to recruit additional ultra runners. And I think, like if cost was no whatever, or if, if we had enough people, like we should just go to every marathon and go a 10th of a mile. So what, like a block down the street with a big sign that's like, come, you know, like just cross this finish line and you're an ultra runner, you know, because once you've crossed that first finish line um, and it would be hilarious, like, oh, I'm, you know, technically an ultra runner if I've gone 26.3, right? It's more than marathon distance. So brilliant. <laughs> like. Dude, that is like legitimate, one of the most brilliant ideas I've ever, ever heard. I mean, no, honestly, that is so funny. Like to go to the end of the block and hold up a big sign, like join the ultra runner ranks or, you know, become an ultra yeah. runner, run here. Run this much farther and you're automatically an ultra runner. We're a block away. Like you, it's pretty much like the end of the shoot anyways. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so like, yeah, run here, you get a second medal. And then like that person in their head is like, oh, I'm an ultra runner now. Well, okay. Well, what other ultras should I sign up for? Hard Rock 100. That's it. <laughs> yeah, just right into it. But I, mean, I just I, I, go ahead. Sorry. I uh, just you know I think like once you're over that first barrier of like oh I, I'm now done it you know like when I finished way too cool right away you know Dylan was like are you gonna do another one and I was like maybe ask me that tomorrow <laughs> but but you know like the next year I came back and and uh, and took a, I think I took like 45 minutes off my time and then I was like definitely hooked after that you know because then it was like this new challenge and there was yep. everyone was different and i think what what was exciting and the most exciting for me was you know a lot of marathoners like have their time like oh i'm a, I'm a 235 marathon whatever and the beautiful thing about ultra running is like that doesn't really work you know like oh well uh yeah i can run a 50k in this but it had 3,000 feet of climb oh this one actually had seven so there's like not an easy way to compare anything unless you're running the same exact uh, trail right so i love that that you can't compare necessarily you just can only give people respect that's i mean that's one thing that drew me to the sport and you to the sport mm -hmm. is that especially from from road running is that it really does become 
a, a question of how was it rather than how fast was it? You know, it's like, how was that 50 mile experience? Because I bet it was brutal versus how fast did you do it? In? You know, like what, how long were you out there? It's sort of a, it's a different, unique relationship with the actual sport. And it's about experience less than speed, you know? Um, I, man, I, I want to go in so different, so many different directions here because <clears throat> I am curious, like, are there more of you? Are there more Aaron Lucy's <laughs> at, at Red Bull? Or are you, you know, are you one very, well, I know you're very unique, but <laughs> does, does Red Bull have a lot of you? And like, do you have to manage a very set number of athletes or do you have infinite number of athletes? Uh, so I think there's, uh, I want to say like 12 other athlete managers at Red Bull. So we, you know, we're spread, spread geographically. So there's um, athlete managers in every corner of the States. And then of course, around the world, there are also ultra, um, sorry, uh, athlete managers. Yeah. And do you <laughs> um, only deal with athletes within your region? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you, did you get to choose where you live? Um, I mean, I, I, I was here, things have kind of changed a little bit over the last couple of years and in the structure and everything, but I've been in Portland for quite a while and just, uh, I'm not moving. So yeah. <laughs> I won't keep it, doing it, man. It, it's funny because I think when we moved back to the Northwest, it was one of those, like, why did we ever leave? You know, it's, it's such a, such a great place. And I know where you live is so great. So beautiful. I mean, you've got such an incredible backyard and I mean, I guess the, the ice storm mm. probably did some damage in your, in your little local area, but I know that you're just Portland in general is just so gorgeous. We've got Forest Park and Mount Hood and everything like that. Yeah. I do want to talk a little bit about media creation and filmmaking and stuff because we had some great questions here in the chat. Uh, Kim was listening the whole time. You had to step away. You took care <laughs> yeah. of the dog. He's back. He's chill. We're all good. Uh, and I don't know if I missed it, but there was a lot of people you'd mentioned, uh, like knowing or recommending, oh, this book would be great or this podcast or this music or there's a lot of people in the chat room. We have the Ginger Runner crew has their own book club. So there's a lot of people kind of flipping out of like you mentioning books and books maybe being a key part for some people. Um, so I don't know if you guys touched on that at all, but Not, I didn't no want to gloss specific. over it because a lot of people were very excited to hear, you know, something like a book yeah. mentioned especially in respect to when you think of like a Red Bull athlete, you're like, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned the book, uh, that came up in, um, or you handed it, sorry, you gave it to, I got to pull up the athlete's name, uh, Rebecca oh, Re Rush. Yep. Mm -hmm. You gave her a book before she went off to film <laughs> blood road, right? Yep. That's correct. And that's a perfect tie in <laughs> to the production side of things, because I think one of the other really unique and fun aspects of, of your job is, is sort of, thinking outside the box and thinking production wise and filmmaking wise and, and content wise. So this is another part of your history being a YouTuber and a filmmaker with VHS days and that sort of thing. <laughs> Do you have the ability to like come up with film ideas? And is this part of the job that you really love? Is it new sort of what is your experience and what is your role in producing some of the films that people in the chat room were talking about, such as Blood Road and all these incredible flicks that Red Bull's put out. Yeah, I mean, it's it kind of takes a different form every single time. You know, before I came to Red Bull, I worked for a company called Freecaster, which actually launched, I think, within a week of YouTube. And it was only premium uh, action sports content and it was live content. A lot of the content that we produce at Freecaster is now on Red Bull TV. And I used to travel and film a ton, making both VHSs and DVDs. And then we were making branded content before YouTube was a thing where we mm -hmm. would just embed it on the company's website, which is really crazy to think about now. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I came to Red Bull and, and I kind of didn't do any production stuff for quite some time. And then as I got back into the athlete role, you know, Blood Rose was one of my first projects as an athlete manager. Um, I had a hand in the, um, I guess I was executive producer for, uh, a film called Any One of Us, which was on HBO. Um, it was about spinal cord injury. One of uh, a competitor at an event who I knew really, really well before he got hurt. Um, we kind of worked together and, and uh, kind of told and shared his story and then brought in a lot of other stories of people who'd had spinal cord injuries in all kinds of different backgrounds and stuff. Um, so, you know, I've had, I've had opportunities to yeah, play a role in all kinds of different stuff. And then, you know, getting to the the YouTube stuff was kind of just uh, more of a creative outlet, you know. Along the way, I've been able to to have all play all these different roles and making all these different things. Um, the uh, the Lost Coast project that we did together, for example, um, where yeah, I just I think prior to to what I'm doing now, I would just find the right people 
and put them together with the athletes and then let, you know, try to stay out of the way as much as possible. Like yeah. give them the room to, to make it happen, put the experts in where they need to do their stuff and, um, and, and kind of make room for them. And, and, uh, you know, I think one thing that we did that I thought was really special about Lost Coast was the director's cut where it was just like, just let Ethan make the film that he wants to make because it's going to be the best one <laughs> instead of making a 30 second social cut of of this thing. And uh, I'm really I'm really proud of, of that one. I thought that came together. Awesome. Um, it's funny, like, because that's actually that's the first place that we met each other in person. I think we kind of had like a mutual admiration for each other's sort of paths getting to where we were getting. And I, I just want to say this because I've worked with brands many times in the past, less as Ginger Runner, because I think part of being Ginger Runner was sort of like, I don't want to deal with anyone telling me what to do. Red Bull was the first actual project that I worked with a brand on. And mostly it was because Dylan, uh, you know, Dylan sort of like, hey, I have this idea. I want to run Lost Coast. And do you want to help make something? I was like, uh, I really like Dylan. I'm a huge fan. But I didn't know what it was going to be like working with Red Bull. I actually used to be, I used to work for Red Bull back in college as what's called a student brand manager. I used to just hand <laughs> out cans of Red Bull on campus and stuff. So I was kind of like, oh, this would be really cool. Maybe people I knew Full worked circle. at. Full circle. <laughs> so there was a part of me kind of excited about that. But I have to commend you as the, uh, the individual at Red Bull that sort of was like the representative on location that sort of overseeing everything. The process was... Dude, it was like hanging out with friends, making cool video. Like there was no, it wasn't a brand. It was just a bunch of cool people hanging out, just enjoying making rad stuff. And it was this this weird experience where I'm so used to dealing with clients and stuff from my history. Like corporate. Very corporate. Type stuff. Very like, okay, this has got to go through 17 different approval processes and it's going to be dragged out <laughs> over 17 months and it's, maybe it'll see the light of day. But what what you allowed was like, as the executive producer was essentially, you know, man, just create what you want to create. Like we'll do a Red Bull edit, we'll do a director's cut. And that gave me a blueprint to just, this is how I only want to work. If I ever work with the brand again and worked with Dylan again recently with North Face, it was the same thing. It was like a fantastic experience, Aaron, that you laid out. And I think that has to come from your background, right? That has to come from your background making uh, bike videos and stuff. Cause you've been on that side of the camera, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, both as an athlete and as a content creator, like I've experienced what it was like on the other side and I want to make the right and, you know, I want to have the right environment for everybody to do their best work. And I do think like there are certain scenarios where I may have an opinion that's valuable, but a lot of the times like, you know, <laughs> you're the filmmaker, Dylan's the athlete, like you guys are supposed to go make awesome stuff together and then in the same way like I was before, like, where can I add that 1%? Is it my, like, hey, uh, what if we did a director's cut? Is that worth, you know, uh, is that the thing that makes it special all of a sudden? Where are the elements that I can come in and, and make it even better, give you guys the right resources to get it done? So, um, yeah, I think definitely, like, my history is has played into making the experience good for everyone around me, I guess. I mean, yeah, I mean, trust me, I'm very... I'm very picky. The GR crew knows this. Like I talk about this a lot on Daily Brew, just as far as I Red Bull and North Face, and it's basically Dylan. That's sort of the, the, yeah. the, the tie through, <laughs> surprisingly, uh, or unsurprisingly, because he's such a rad dude. But that's it. That's all I've ever done, really, with brands because it's it, those two experiences have been so. Hey, we trust you. We don't want any. We like hands off. You're gonna make something cool. We trust it, and it's been such a cool experience so that this is me saying thank you aaron for having like faith in a youtuber uh coming mm -hmm. in and, and making a movie uh it was such a cool experience and now seeing you with litzy time youtube channel and you making your content again with the bike it's such it's such a cool full circle for you do you like it like is it something that you missed and you came back to it is it a creative outlet did you have time on your hands or has there been a goal with the videos uh, like for example, your, your personal record, you know, that sort of thing, like documenting <laughs> your journey to your personal record with, what is it called? The bunny hop? Side hop. Side uh, hop. Yeah. I think it was kind of a bit of a full circle, you know? Um, I think I really, you know, the first couple of years that I came to Red Bull, I was really happy to put down the camera because I just like, I was tired. I've been lugging that, that backpack around for the last 
decade prior and I was just really tired of of being everywhere holding a camera watching all my friends have fun <laughs> and then going home and editing all the footage and putting it out and we got to do some amazing things don't get me wrong but I was definitely ready to put it down and do something different by the time I came to Red Bull and this year definitely I think one of the lessons that came out for me and, and maybe for a lot of people was you you had an opportunity to really decide what was important to you and what was valuable. And for me, it was, it was a matter of like, I really miss creating and I've had a chance to be a part of the creative process for some really cool things, but I really miss editing. I miss like shooting something, putting it on the timeline and sharing with my friends. And so that kind of started and, and I also really wanted to learn the YouTube platform. I wanted to understand how it works. I wanted to dig in. I wanted to have uh, an exponential uh, learning curve. Yeah. And this seemed like a really cool thing to, to learn. I have enough to be dangerous from my editing background and my writing background that I was like, I think there's something cool here that people would be willing to check out. I think I have something to say. I think I have something to share. I have ideas that I want to pursue for myself here and I now sort of have the time to do it. Yeah. Um, it's been a challenging year with like, you know, four and a six year old at home while holding a, down a full time job and trying to stay somewhat fit. There's a lot going on. <laughs> you really I was going to say when you like were asking the question, you're like, did you just have like all this extra free time? I was I like, thought the same I thing when I said know. that. I was like, oh, wait, yeah, full time job, <laughs> family man, like so much stuff going on. Yeah, it's been a pretty aggressive past year. Um, but but honestly, I, I needed a creative outlet. I had this interest. I mean, I guess all of the above to answer your question, I, I really wanted to learn all this stuff. I really wanted to create again. I really wanted to share what I had. And and then this goal of can I break the record that, you know, when I was 18, I set this world record. I broke the existing world record and added two inches to the height. So what you do on a side hop, you're balancing in place next to a high jump bar and then you jump up and over the high jump bar and uh, land on the other side without knocking it off. And so it was 36 inches when the before the competition, I put it up to 38 and a half. And uh, that was a huge day for me. I was like 18 years old. I was actually riding a modified uh, cross country bike at the time. So like wasn't even the right bike. And uh, that was awesome. And that that made a big difference for my career as a professional rider and opened up more opportunities for me. And that was kind of like my thing. And uh, and then, you know, kind of put the bike away and, and got a real job and did my thing and and uh, became an ultra runner, you know, whatever. <laughs> and I then had this bike that was kind of collecting dust and, and thought, you know what, I bet I could let's just see, you know, uh, the bike is actually the right bike to do this kind of stuff. It's not a, you know, modified cross country bike. Um, I'm certainly a little bit bigger than I was when I was 18, but I've got dad strength. So mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> you know, maybe this balances out, maybe I could still do it. And so I think I texted you maybe around like July or August, like, dude, I'm going to try to do this thing <laughs> and I'm going to film it. And I might put it on YouTube if it goes okay. And I thought maybe it would take me a week to, to get back to where I was. And I started, you know, it, it it came back relatively quick. I was up over 24 inches pretty quickly, but then I got to 30 and then I really kind of like hit the skids around like 34, 35. I was there for a while okay. and, uh, it was super frustrating and I wasn't spending every day of every week, you know, working on it, but I try to get out once a weekend and try to break it. And, uh, it was driving me crazy. So I was making all this other content that was also like developing in different ways and, and trying different things and just learning the process, getting comfortable on camera, all these other things that you learn along the way. And then finally, a couple of weeks ago, I broke it. And uh, yeah, it was like the best feeling ever. <laughs> so uh, now, now I, I actually have your video pulled up here. I think I can show it. Um, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping people can see it. I don't know if they'll be able to hear it because I, I literally just made this on the fly. But uh, this is from Aaron's YouTube channel. This is a side hop. This is a, is this a trials bike? Yep. Yeah. So that one doesn't have a seat. <laughs> okay. No seat. And so this is Which what we'll, it, I think we need to get to that also. Well, Why there's no, no seat. seat. Yeah, exactly. But you can watch. It's a, oh, God. <laughs> uh, 
I'm assuming that's the record breaking hop right there at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh, God. How many inches is that? That's 39 inches over a bar. Get out of here, man. You, that... should, um, you should try that with your so, road bike. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. So that's uh, it's definitely not a world record. I have no idea what the world record is now. I'm sure it's like a foot higher, um, but it's for sure my personal best. And uh, maybe it's like a world record for people that are 40 plus that still ride trials. Like we'll I don't know. there's some like, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's it's awesome, and I love sort of hearing this journey for you. Uh, I love this journey for you, Aaron. Uh, but just <laughs> having the trials bike background, setting this world record, having all this time expanding your your sport knowledge, your uh, athlete knowledge, like you you you've done so much for the athletes that you manage in bringing people together and learning and making them the best that they can be. But now you're doing that for yourself. And even if it's, you know, the small thing, a personal challenge that you've had in the back of your head, like, hey, I wonder if I can beat that. You're really taking the last few decades of your life and your experience and bringing them together for yourself. So how long did you say it took for you to kind of get to this stage just when you started back up again? Probably about six months to get back to where I was. It's amazing. That's amazing, man. And what's what's next like are you going to continue to trials ride like you're going to continue to kind of keep this as a passion and, and get on the bike as often as possible i love the youtube channel it, it's it's awesome it's super fun yeah uh i've actually got some i've got some pretty exciting stuff in in mind for the youtube channel um so so what i want to do actually is uh get us actually i haven't said this, but anyways um i'm, I'm going to get a space and i'm going to create uh, a rideable art installation that can change on like a monthly basis. So I'll add features to it. I'll have special artists come in, highlight them, ride the art, you know, the art installation essentially that they're putting together and then do more of the how to show more of the background of what I'm doing and yeah, make it interesting for everybody. So um, that's the, like the goal is to just like keep having fun riding, do something that's interesting and, and, uh, you know, other people can relate to, I'm sure not everybody, uh, can relate to a guy riding a bike without a seat. Uh, <laughs> but, but I do think, you know, there are some other really interesting things there that people would love to see, you know, some of the art elements or, or, you know, just to be like, what is this? Like, I, I want to learn more about it. And it's a way for me to get people engaged in the sport. I mean, if you look, uh, within mountain biking and especially on YouTube, some of the biggest content creators are actually trials riders. Uh, you may be familiar with Danny McCaskill or, uh, Fabio Widmer, like some of the biggest channels are actually trials riders. And so it's not necessarily about, um, you know, the biggest amount of riders that do that, but just being able to share biking with people that maybe aren't into biking yet. And, and how can I give them the first couple of tutorials to get them on the way to learning it? Cause it's uh it's kind of tedious to learn for sure like to get to the point where i'm at it took me a long time yeah but a lot of the stuff really can apply to regular mountain bike riding like you could apply so much of this to the trails and stuff like that just your video about balance uh and sort of converting your own balance beam and, and learning that sort of stuff i was like man i just want to get a bike and try it I'm, I, you know i'm not going to be a professional anytime soon but listen if red bull wants to sponsor me yeah i'll take it but it was <laughs> also kind of like got a, <laughs> i know a guy I was like, I just kind of want to try. I want to try to balance on a, a four by four or something like that. Don't forget that you're 40 now. I know. So is Aaron. <laughs> yeah. Look what he did. 40, 41. We're good. Yeah, we're totally good. All right. All right. You're fine. <laughs> uh, I do want to, uh, before we sort of wrap up the, the main show here, I do want to sort of transition to the Wings of Life run that you guys do because it it's, it, it's an incredible cause and event. And I know your athletes participate it's got a big global participation i think some of our crew participates every year can you just touch on that a little bit let us know about that event when it is can people sign up stuff like that yeah so uh so may 9th is the actual event and what's cool if you go to wingsforlifeworldrun.com you can sign up i think it's 23 dollars to sign up it's actually a, a it's it's a virtual race but it's totally different than everything else um and it's been it's been this way pre-pandemic um and and basically what it is is this app on your phone everyone starts at the same time around the world so on the west coast of the united states it's actually four o'clock in the morning that we start and <laughs> you you run and the finish line gives you about a 30 minute head start and then it starts 
kind of creeping up on you. I think it runs like a 630 pace for the first uh, 20 miles or something, or first 10 miles or something, and then it, this, the pace speeds up. Essentially, you run, the finish line catches you. So you don't know how far you're going to run until the finish line catches up to you. And it gives you updates along the way of like how far back the, the catcher car is. It gives you updates of how far you've run. So you're just listening to it in your ear or just on your phone while you're running with it. Um, you can run anywhere you want, really. Like I run actually at a track by my house, um, which is, uh, yeah, the easiest way to, to just log miles, basically. But you could trail run. You could go wherever you have basically phone service. Yeah, GPS. And, service, right? Yeah. So uh, it's just. It's super fun. It's super easy. It 100% of the proceeds actually go to spinal cord research. So the, yeah, it's it's rare like that that a that an organization that a charity would have 100% of their stuff go somewhere, but the administrative cost is already taken out. So 100% of it goes directly to Wings for Life, and uh, it's an incredible charity. I've been working with them for a really long time, and I'm really fired up for this one. Uh, I will tell you that I am normally running like around 20 miles. At like a solid clip. I know Dylan went a lot farther. <laughs> uh, sort of, I think he did like 32 miles. Wow. He was like, oh, I think I'm just going to run like a marathon and then call it. And then I saw him after the race and I was like, how did it go? He's like, oh, I, I think I did like 32. <laughs> if he's in the chat, maybe he'll correct me. But I think it was 32. But, That's uh, nuts. But we, Dylan. We, <laughs> we did do some of these in person, you know, in the past. And it was really special to have like thousands of people running down the road and, and, uh, you know, we were doing it in LA. So like the sun would come up basically as you got caught and then you have the rest of the day to eat food and celebrate. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. It's, uh, it's May 9th. It's, uh, it's a fun way to kind of kick off the day, especially if you're on the West coast, cause you'll be done probably by seven or eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. But, uh, it's really cool to, you know, there's thousands and thousands of people that run all over the world for this event. And then the event ends when the last person gets caught. So you never know how, you know, what the distance is going to be. It could be somebody who's in Austria, Japan, it could be here, it could be wherever. Uh, and I think that's what makes it so special. And I think it's also like, yeah, I don't know. It's, it, I feel like it's a good chance to like, try to see if you can make it to ultra distance, you know? Um, I remember yeah, that from one. last year, it was really cool to, to, to see the last few remaining runners and sort of going, oh my God, like there's still three people running and they don't know who is going to hold on the longest because uh, they can't see each other. They're, they're countries apart. Was it was it Wardian that won? Or is that maybe a couple years ago? I'm not sure. I, I'm not if either, you... actually. I forget who it was. But it's so cool to see how this thing wraps up towards the end. Um, I'm super excited about it, man. And I'm glad that you guys are doing it virtually through the app. I think that's such a cool use of technology. I, I'm a big fan of that type of stuff. And it, uh, as Vivian says in the chat, sounds fun. I'm like, it does sound yeah, fun. Yeah, it's just different different than everything else out there uh you rock man it, it's great to like sit down and catch up a little bit and and get a little bit of history and and kind of learn what you're doing with everything uh as far as running is concerned you have any events lined up this year besides wing wings for life are you doing anything uh towards the end of the year is 100k still the goal i would love to do 100k my my goal last year because i was turning 40 so i ran 40 miles for my 40th birthday and then my goal was actually to run a hundred K in a, in a, in a marathon. I wanted to, I wanted to qualify for Western States and qualify for Austin in the same year. Of course, as they say on ultra running means, I know I'll never get into Western States, but at least to qualify by like doing the hundred K, yeah. um, and then to qualify for Boston by, you know, running, I think, what is it? Sub sub three, if you're, uh, if you're 40 plus. So like, that was the goal always to like, knock both those down in the same year uh yeah i don't know i'm not sure what this year is gonna do um i'm not totally we'll sure see. yet i, I want to get back on the train and get that 100k and 100 mile under my belt and then we'll see what happens after that um i'm just really enjoying it you know coming from a mountain bike background running trails is like that's still what i love to do and, and it's just a different vehicle to get it done so um yeah that's awesome man uh, as we sort of wrap up the main show, we are going to be talking with Aaron a little bit in the after show as well. So if you have any remaining questions and stuff, you can get those into the chat. But we'll we'll touch base with him in the after show here in just a second. Uh, but Aaron, can you just let people know who are watching or who are listening where they can find you on social, where they can watch your videos and, and learn more about uh, trials bikes and why the bike doesn't have a seat? I think we're on the after show. Uh, okay. But where can they find you? 
Sure. Uh, so on YouTube, it's uh, the channel name is Lutzi Time. And uh, on everything else, Instagram is probably your best bet. And that's just Aaron at Aaron Lutzi. Uh, and, and just to, to answer the question, the reason that the bike doesn't have a seat is that the, the top tube of the bike is so low that if it did have a seat, I mean, you wouldn't be able to comfortably sit down on it. It's, it's you know, it would be around like your shin or knee height. So you'd have to actually crouch down really low to sit <laughs> on the seat. And so it's easier just to remove it and it's, you know, less weight for the bike and it keeps it out of the way because a lot of the big moves that you're doing on the bike, you're pushing the bike kind of out in front of you and, and, and the, the wheel and the, and the frame are coming up really close. Uh -huh. And, uh, and so it actually gives you a little bit more clearance to be able to push the bike a little bit higher and stuff. So that actually makes sense. Cause now I'm thinking about the, the side hop and that's exactly what happens with the bike physically is that it comes up so high that you need to get that extra height. Uh, our guest tonight, Aaron Lutzi, uh, Red Bull athlete marketing manager. He handles a lot of the most incredible athletes in the world, including our good friend Dylan Bowman, of course, and uh, also mountain bike trials writer, ultra runner himself. It was a great conversation. We're so honored to have him on the show. Thanks, Aaron, for joining us. And uh, we're going to wrap up the main show, move into the after show. Mm -hmm. But of course, before we do, we have a little segment mm -hmm. we like to call our GR crew member of the week, where we get to recognize members of the community who go above and beyond, uh, kick ass and all sorts of good stuff. <laughs> Who is this All week's sorts of good stuff. GR crew member? Uh, this week's GR crew member of the week is Drew Slate. And Drew said, I finished the Yeti Ultra 24 hour challenge. First 5.2 miles at 5 p.m. one day, and then 5.2 mile runs at 9, 1, 5 a.m., 9 a.m., 1 p.m., 31.2 miles, 50K done. Pretty proud that I got it done. Congratulations, Drew. Way to go, Drew. Uh, you are a crew member of the week. We're so honored to, uh, to bestow the honor upon thee for the next seven days. <laughs> Uh, once you, then you have to give the trophy back, right? Yeah, just mail <laughs> just the crown back. back to us. Just send it back. Just wipe it down. Uh, but thank you so much, Drew, for being a part of the crew. We appreciate you, and congratulations again. And to our live viewers, we appreciate you so much. Thank you for tuning in to Ginger Runner Live tonight, episode 348. We're going to move right into the after show. If you would like to join us in the after show tonight or any Monday or be a part of our daily live streams, all you got to do is go to patreon.com slash oh, there it is patreon.com slash the ginger <laughs> runner for as little as two dollars a month you get access to our after shows including tonight's and all archived versions of it we'd love to have you the gr crew is truly a special place um that's it thanks everyone thanks all we hope you are getting out there training hard racing harder and partying the hardest i know i am we'll see you guys next week bye, bye, -bye. ginger runner